so I am just going to put this out there. I am a developer. I can make eye contact, though. So I hope, I hope you guys will all have me. <laughs> so when Madeline asked me to speak here, I was very excited. And I asked her what she'd like me to talk about. And she said, oh, I leave that to you. So I'm not going to talk to you about testing today. I'm going to teach you to be hackers. This is not working, though. <laughs> so I'm picked up. Oh, because I have theirs. There we go. OK. So part one, how to be a hacker. My dad was a huge computer geek. He worked at UNIVAC in the 60s and wrote code for some of the world's first computers. So I got into programming kind of freakishly young. When I was eight years old, my brother and I were terrible students. And so my parents did what any good parents would do, and they bribed us. <laughs> they said, whichever one of you makes the honor roll first will buy you a game station. Now, they weren't talking about an Xbox or a PlayStation or a Nintendo, because this was 1980, and Atari's rolled. So the next quarter, when I dutifully turn over my report card full of A's, my dad takes me out to buy an Atari. Only, we didn't go to a store. We went to a stranger's house. And he didn't buy me an Atari game machine. He bought me an Atari computer. The reason we had to go to someone's house is because this was 1980, and nobody had home computers yet. So. I'd wanted a game machine, but this was OK. In fact, this was even better, because we had so many games. Boxes and boxes of those five and a quarter inch floppies, if anyone remembers those, filled with games that my dad would download off of computer bulletin boards over his 300 baud modem. You guys remember those? And not just games. It was very important that we have exactly the right joystick boxes and boxes of joysticks. And for all of this wealth of games that I had at my fingertips, my favorite game as an eight-year-old was strip poker. <laughs> I can't explain it. <laughs> Somehow, in between all of my strip poker sessions, I would occasionally write these silly little programs or my dad and I would sit down together and type in the machine code from the back of Atari magazines that look like this. These were our father-daughter bonding experiences growing up. 1993. I'm a junior in college. I'm majoring in management information systems. And there weren't very many people at my college in this major. And so pretty much all my classes had the same people in them, or all my core classes. And they always make you work in teams, and we always wanted to work with our friends, so we were pretty much in the same teams for all of these classes. For my database class, our project was to write an application. And the rest of my team was like, oh, shit. And I was like, I've done 8 bit strip poker. I got this. For our networking class, our project was to pick a topic on networking and write a paper on it and present it to the class. And like, I couldn't think of anything more boring. So I made a deal with them. I said, I'll write the application. You guys write the paper. The day before we're set to present to our networking class, and this is all of us as a team that are presenting, my team comes up to me in the student lounge, very intervention style. And they said, Abby, we're worried about you. Have you even read our paper yet? Fortunately, the idea of presenting in this class, or at least the idea that we chose to interpret it as, was each of us reading a section of our paper. So I'll read it in class. Why do I need to read it before then? Our paper was on this thing called the internet. I didn't know what that was. I was having fun coding, whatever. So it is literally as I am standing in front of my networking class in 1993, listening to my teammates read each of their sections of the paper. And while I'm reading my section of the paper for the very first time in front of the class, 
did I learn what the internet is? I went down to the computer lab afterwards and I said, I'd like some internet, please. A year later, I graduated. I got to work for this awesome little startup called Spaceworks. This is 94. Most people have not heard of the internet yet. They weren't in my networking class. And until now, the only way I'd had to access the internet was to dial into my school's Unix machine and use Lynx, which was a command line, fully text-based browser. Has anyone ever used Lynx here? Ah, oh, yes. OK, sweet. <laughs> so there were images on some of the web pages, but I had no idea how to view them. So it was all just text. By the time I got to Spaceworks, they had Mosaic and Netscape came out light 94. So we actually had graphical windows that we could view web pages in. We could see images. But beyond that, they weren't a whole lot further along than those text-based browsers. But companies, they wanted to do business on this internet thing. So my company took this browser that was meant only for reading text and linking between sites, and they gave it functionality. They gave it the ability to do things. I thought it was really stupid. I didn't get it. At the time, what we were able to do seemed so tiny and so insignificant. I'm like, why are we even wasting our time? A year later, the Gartner Group, you guys know the Gartner Group, they're this big company that talks, tells other big companies what the industry trends are to follow. The Gartner Group comes out to my little 30-person startup and interviews us on what we've built. I didn't want to talk to them. I don't like talking to big company people. And I was like, whatever, can I just get back to coding now? The next year, they award my startup for furthering the state of e-commerce on the internet. Not a phrase you're going to hear these days. And I just kept stumbling into these startups that were doing these amazing things that no one had ever done before. And granted, it was the 90s, it was the dot-com era. I'm sure that was going on at a lot of startups. But nonetheless, for me, it is such a rush to take these things that look totally impossible, like reverse engineering hex dumps, which if you guys, it's like looking at a data stream and binary, which would be zeros and ones, but it's hex instead. I was so pissed off that my boss gave me this assignment, which was so obviously stupid to stare at hex and figure out how to reverse engineer it. But I'm really stubborn, and I really like to be right. So I decided to spend the entire next day doing nothing but staring at screens and screens that look like this. So that at the end of the day, when I just wasted an entire eight hours staring at hex, I could tell her, yeah, you're nuts. The thing is, as humans, we're really good at picking out patterns. So less noble than furthering the state of e-commerce on the internet. But you are looking at the person who created the very first targeted ad insertion solution for streaming media. <laughs> In other words, I took your perfectly good music and video screens and figured out how to fill them with ads. <laughs> you can thank me later. Oh, well, you can thank me now. <laughs> So I had all of these amazing experiences, and yet for every single one, I didn't understand. I thought all we're doing is these things that are duct tape, band-aided, and glued together hacks. And that's exactly what they were. Bruce Schneier defines hacker as someone who thinks outside the box, someone who discards conventional wisdom and decides to do something instead. Someone who looks at a set of rules and wonders what happens if we don't follow them. Someone who looks at the edge and wonders what's beyond. It reminds me of that quote by George Bernard Shaw, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable man persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress is made by the unreasonable man. When I think of hackers, I don't think of people who break into computers and steal credit cards or hack voting machines to rig elections. Never. Oh, this is... 
I think of people who move the world forward. I think of hackers who take it, hacking as people who take a thing and twist it and make it do something far beyond what it was ever intended for. When Galileo took a piece of curved glass and used it to look at the stars, no one had ever done that before. No one had ever even thought about that before. Before that glass, it was just glass. And so, as Schneier says, while the term is new, the idea itself is as old as curiosity. There's this amazing book called Hackers that not surprisingly is one of my favorite books called Stephen Levy. And in it, he talks about the early computer hackers starting at MIT in the 1950s. And this insatiable thirst for knowledge that drove them to creating the technology that forms the basis for all that we use today. These were among the first people who were able to figure out how to do things with computers that went further than just feeding them punch cards and getting results back and just thinking they were some dumb machine. These were the first people who looked at computers and said, this, these are things that we can create art and beauty on. These were the first people who believed that computers could change our lives. These were the people that, by the time my dad got into programming in the late 60s, felt like he was getting in too late because all the cool stuff had already been done. And these students at MIT in the 50s, they were people who loved to understand how systems work. They were the kind of people who would take apart their parents' radios when they were kids to learn about circuitry and transistors and what made things work. They, one kid took discarded parts from pinball machines because in the 50s there isn't like a lot of sources of components to build computers out of and tried to build his own computer in the 1950s. But there wasn't a lot of computers around at this time for them to play with, so instead, they played with model trains. Now, I'm a little bit joking on the played with part, because this was not the train track that goes around your Christmas tree and has a little choo-choo that kids play with. This was MIT. This was a railway system that was a massive labyrinth that if you put all the railway tracks side by side together, it would be five miles worth of track. That one is actually from the Mail Railroad Club today, which is still around. And that were controlled by systems that harnessed the full technology that was available at MIT. And so what these students were interested in was not modeling trains. It was in the systems that made them run. When they weren't working on these systems, they would sneak into MIT's first computer labs at night, not to break things, not to steal things, but to write code, to feed these machines punch cards and see what came out, to better understand how the systems worked. They'd hang out at their model railroad club days, nights, weekends, constantly looking for ways to improve the system. They created their own jargon that was completely incomprehensible to others. So when a machine was failing, it was losing. When a student insisted upon studying instead of working on the system, they were a tool. And when somebody did something clever and ingenious and unthought of with the use of technology, it was a hack. And the ones who did the most on the systems called themselves hackers with pride. These were just a bunch of geeks, just very, very smart geeks, who were not setting out to change the world. They were just following their curiosity. But even though they were not tra trying to change the world, they kind of did. Part two, haters gonna hate. Amazon CEO and founder Jeffrey Bezos, one-time internet poster boy and internet pinata, is back with yet another new idea. It's so far from Amazon's retail core that you may well wonder if he has finally slipped off the deep end. Said Bloomberg was this week about Amazon Web Services. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Amazon Web Services, but basically computers and data and everything in the cloud. I looked before this talk, because I was just curious, over the last year, Amazon Web Services brought in over $10 billion in revenue for Amazon. So slipped off the deep end, indeed. 
The reality distortion field is starting to warp Steve's mind if he thinks for one second that this thing is going to take off. Said Mac rumors about the iPod. You know that thing that led to these little things called the iPhone and the iPad? It's an amazing invention, but who would ever want to use one? Said President Rutherford B. Hayes about the telephone. The problem with innovation is that the best ideas look like terrible ideas. So as an example, I'm going to create a site for the small niche market, so not a lot of people, who don't have a lot of money to let them do something that doesn't matter. When Facebook started, it was only for college students. How about I'm going to get an air mattress, blow it up, put it on the floor of my apartment, and rent it out. When Airbnb started, that's exactly what it was about. The air is about air mattresses. <laughs> if you have an idea that looks like a good idea to other people, if you can go up to other people and tell them your idea and they nod and go, yeah, that totally makes sense, then it might be a good business idea, but it's not a breakthrough innovation. Breakthrough innovations are so far off from what we're used to, they break our ways of thinking about the world, of how we understand things. And so the thing is, the more terrible the innovation is, the worse it's going to look. So if you come up with something that's really innovative, the rest of the world's going to think you're loco. The problem or the challenge with this is that bad ideas also look like bad ideas. So it's complicated. If you want to be truly innovative, if you want to do something that does break with other people's thinking about the world and how things work, you, have, you can't just think your way to it linearly and logically. You have to be able to put yourself in a place where you can see things that others can't see, where you can find these ideas and understand the reason that they're good ideas, even when other people think that they're really bad ideas, so that you can have the belief in what you're doing, even when other people tell you this is a terrible idea and you really should get a day job. To believe, as Albert Einstein did, that if at first the idea is not absurd, then there is no hope for it. There was uh, some research into this question of what is it that makes entrepreneurs entrepreneurial. And what the researchers found is that entrepreneurs think differently than normal people. Normal people employ what the researchers call causal reasoning. That is, they figure out what they want to do, they set an end goal, and come up with a step-by-step -step plan for how to get there. Very straightforward, not how entrepreneurs think. When entrepreneurs are trying to do something, they use effectual reasoning, which is they don't even start with a specific end goal in mind. Instead, they take a hard look at where they are today, at who they are, what they know, who they know, and they start to tinker. They start exploring the possible things that can be created out of all of this. And so they allow their goals to emerge over time rather than defining them up front. The cool thing about this is if you start with an idea, or if you start with an end goal, you know where you're going, then that's not going to be innovative because you already know where you're going, right? And even if interesting things come up along your path, you've got a plan, you have an end goal that you're trying to reach. It doesn't make sense to veer off and look at these other things, which is fine. They might not be anything, and you've got places to be, right? But it doesn't leave you open to things like serendipity. Whereas if your only goal, if your goal is not to do anything specific, not to arrive at anywhere specific, if your criteria for success is learning rather than execution, if you, if you allow yourself to be guided by your learning and what comes out of that, then you are exactly open to serendipity and to discovering things that nobody would have ever figured out before. And that 
is where innovative ideas come from. It's kind of like those hackers at MIT in the 50s who would sneak into the computer labs at night. It wasn't like they had a specific thing they were trying to do. There wasn't a specific program that they were trying to write. They were just trying to learn. They were just trying to follow their curiosity and learn about the systems. Oh. If you really want to change the world, you should look to evolution, because evolution is the ultimate hacker. There's this excellent book called Where Good Ideas Come From by Stephen Johnson. And in it, he talks about these parallels that occur between nature, or evolution that occurs in nature, like how we evolve and how our planet evolved, and evolution that's man innovation that's man-made, like the light bulb and the steam engine. And he talks about this idea he calls the adjacent possible. And this is the idea that at any given point in time, there's a set amount of what's possible that can be done in this world, done with the technology and the resources and knowledge that we have available to us today. And so therefore, any innovation that occurs is going to happen at the adjacent possible, meaning just beyond what's possible today. Stephen Johnson calls evolution a tinkerer, not an engineer, because evolution is the embodiment of this. Evolution doesn't wake up one morning and say, I want birds to fly, so here's my 10-step plan for how to get there. There's no causal reasoning going on. Evolution does, however, have this awesome innovation machine called sex that throws random pairs of DNA together to see what happens. And so it evolves by taking the attributes and the skills and the traits that are available to us today and throwing them together and seeing what comes out of it. In dinosaurs, their wrist bones evolved in a certain way because it made them more flexible. And dinosaurs who were more flexible were able to survive by getting away from their enemies. Dinosaurs that weren't flexible got eaten. Those flexible wrist bones, in turn, evolved into what now constitutes the wings of a bird. And along the way, feathers evolved in birds for temperature regulation. So it wasn't like evolution said, I want to create wings so that birds can fly. It was more like evolution stumbled onto this fact that w one day all of the pieces were in place that allowed for flight, and therefore flight became possible, and the realm of what was possible expanded a little. When we look at a lot of the greatest man-made inventions, we see the same pattern. So if we look at the 50 years leading up to the invention of the telephone, we see a inventions and discoveries all building upon one another until finally one day Alexander Graham Bell had all of the pieces in place to allow him to create the first practical telephone. But we don't often see that when we look at innovation, we just see these shiny things that come out at the end and we think they just popped into existence. Like self-driving cars, those are incredibly new, right? Nobody was doing those until Google and Tesla not that many years ago, right? The first driverless car was in 1925. It was an actual full-size car that was driven via remote control up and down the streets of New York City during rush hour. I feel like that would be frowned upon today. In the 1950s, General Motors created a driverless car that traveled via impulses in the road. And in the 1980s, computer vision had advanced to the point that Mercedes-Benz created a driverless car that used computer vision for navigation. And these are only a few of the inventions and the discoveries that built upon one another, leading up to where we are today. And that takes us to actually only 2015, last year. I think we have a very skewed view of innovation. We look at innovation and we think that A, someone came up with an idea and just made it happen. And B, that we totally miss out on the past 90 years worth of inventions and discoveries that were all leading up to this. 
Innovation is not, is messy and it's chaotic. And you can't just get there from following this linear path, even when you look at all the discoveries that happened leading up to self-driving cars where we are today. It's not like it was like A, B, C, D, like a 10-step plan. It was messy. And I like how Steven Johnson says it. He says, if you want to be more innovative, you shouldn't sit around trying to think big thoughts. You should get more parts on the table. There was an interesting study that was done that compared children's brain waves to their IQ scores. And what they found, maybe not surprisingly, is that some children had very logical, organized brains, while others were much more chaotic and disorganized. What was interesting, though, is when they compared the IQ scores of those two groups, they found the chaotic, disorganized ones were smarter. And I think it goes back to this notion of serendipity and evolution and throwing things together to see what happens. At any given point in time, as humans, we have a million, billion different thoughts and ideas bouncing around in our heads. And when we go to sleep and dream at night, these ideas and memories and thoughts get triggered in a basically random fashion. And it, occurs, it causes collisions between otherwise completely unrelated ideas which is the reason that sometimes we have a problem and we can't solve it and we can't solve it and then we wake up one morning and we know the answer. People with disorganized minds, it's kind of the same thing, except their minds are so chaotic that they've got these random pairings and collisions going on in their brains all the time, not just when they're dreaming, even when they're awake. So it gives them an advantage over people who are very thoughtful and organized and thus don't have these weird random pairings going on in their head, but are probably saner. Albert Einstein also said that imagination is more important than knowledge, for knowledge is limited, but imagination encircles the world. And so if we want to be innovative, if we want to really push the boundaries, we have to, on occasion, give ourselves permission to not be our planned out engineering selves, to step away from that and tinker, to give ourselves permission to do things with no expectation as the outcome other than satisfying our curiosity and learning. And when we're able to do that, I believe that that opens us up to the point where even when we're being our planned out engineering selves, we're a little bit more open to noticing and taking a little time on these interesting ideas that come along the way, even when we're heads down working on our goals. A lot of times they're nothing, but sometimes. Part three, do one thing every day that scares you. This is a quote by Eleanor Roosevelt. In 1918, Eleanor Roosevelt was 33 years old. In her 14th year of marriage, when she found out that her husband, Franklin, was in love with her young social secretary, Lucy Mercer. She later confided in a friend that this discovery was devastating, that it felt like the bottom had just dropped out from under her life. And yet, at the same time, this became her most life-changing event, this thing that opened up a world of nearly limitless possibilities that were available to this woman who had previously been too timid to explore them. She ended up becoming a key figure in some of the most important social reform movements of the 1930s, including championing women's rights in the workplace, rights of African Americans, abolishing child labor, including the New Deal, during which she actually appointed women to several key positions in the White House in the 1930s including in the United Nations, where she helped create the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And over and above all of these amazing things, she was the first woman to do so many things that had been totally off limits to women before. And just imagine the guts that that took. Eleanor Roosevelt is considered to be one of the most widely admired people of the last century. And I believe that she defines courage. She came up with this very difficult background and a pretty stifling marriage that up until this point, she was really only valued for her ability to produce children, she produced six, and being a good wife. After this moment, she 
ended up becoming a very powerful partner to her husband, who, of course, eventually became president of the United States. And in talking about these experiences, she says, you gain strength, courage, and confidence with every experience in which you really stop to look fear in the face. You'll be able to say to yourself, I have lived through this horror. I can take whatever comes next. You must do the thing you cannot do. There's this beautiful TEDx talk by Carolyn McHugh called The Art of Being Yourself. And in it, she talks about these amazing larger-than-life figures like Eleanor Roosevelt that we look up to and admire. And she's flashing images of them on the screen. And she says, when we look at these people, what is it that they all have in common? She says, the only thing that they have in common is that they have nothing in common. These are people who've managed to figure out the unique gift that the universe has bestowed on them and figured out a way to put that to service. That our job is not to be anything like these people. In fact, our job is to be as unlike these people as we possibly can. That our only job while we are on this planet is to be as good at being ourselves as they are at being them. Brene Brown, who also did a TED Talk you might have seen on vulnerability, also kind of talks about this notion. She says, we have to be willing to let go of who we think we should be in order to be ourselves. She says, when we're willing to do something like this that we might fail at to really put ourselves out there, it makes us vulnerable. But what makes us vulnerable makes us beautiful. I know that sounds a little bit cheesy, but I believe this is true. I believe that we are the most beautiful when we are being true to who we really are. And who wants to spend time like hanging out with someone who's a clone of everybody else because they're doing what they think they should be doing and thus losing every bit of their personality? I believe that when people are truly being themselves, that is what makes the world a colorful and wonderful place. So Seth Godin talks about our art. He says our art is that, which we're, that that we're doing when we create our best work. It's what we create when we're trying to make an impact, to connect with others. It's something new every time. Our art isn't something just doing the same old thing that we always do. And it doesn't always work precisely because it's new. But every time that we have permission, every time that we have the ability to decide what's next, we have the ability to discover and explore and create an impact. And I believe this takes a lot of courage. And by courage, of course, I don't mean being fearless. I mean the ability to do something in spite of fear. Because I believe that at the intersection between art and our fears lies greatness. I think that, I believe this wholeheartedly, but I also think that this gets harder and harder as we get further in our careers and we get more successful. Um, there's a book that actually talks about the struggle between fear and art and greatness called The War of Art. And in it, author Steven Johnson talks about the resistance. The resistance is this nameless, faceless thing within us that holds us back from doing our art. It's this ridiculous self-procrastination where suddenly it's so urgently important to organize our sock drawer rather than working on our presentation. It's the self-doubt that tears us apart by telling us we're not good enough, we don't know enough to create our own art, to really stand out and do our own thing. He says that the more that we find ourselves resisting doing something, the more that means it's something that we need to be doing. And so we can use our fear as a compass into what we really should be doing, to creating that art that's going to define us because we feel proud of it and allows us to put ourselves out there as something other than just one of the faceless masses. He asks, how many of us develop neurosis simply because we do not do that which calls to us. And so my question to all of you today 
And the one thing that I really want you to walk out of here with is what is calling to you right now that fear is holding you back from? I was talking to my friend Mike Triana about this, and he says that in order to really put ourselves out there and do something that's other than what's expected of us, that sometimes what we really need is for someone or something to give us permission to say it's okay to go do this thing. But we don't often have that. And so it's scary to put ourselves out there and do this thing that we think maybe we're not whatever enough to be walking into a testing conference and teaching you all to be hackers. But he says, every time we're able to overcome that fear, we practice that muscle and it makes our world a little bigger. But every time we decide not to do something because we're afraid of it, we make our world a little smaller. I believe this is true. I believe there is a lot of magic out there in the world, but we don't get to see it by staying in our comfort zones. This gets back to that notion that I think as we get more successful, as we get further along, this becomes more and more difficult. When I started the Hacker Chick blog, nobody knew who I was. And so, yeah, it took some courage to put my ideas out there when they were different than what everyone else was saying. But there's also like a million, billion blogs out there, like who the hell's even gonna find mine, much less read it. And you can't ruin a reputation if you don't have a reputation. Over the past few years, though, I've noticed that my blog posts, which in fairness were never super frequent, were happening less and less often. And worse, they were getting a little less edgy, a little safer. My edgy fuck the establishment blog had gotten boring. And instead of doing something about it, I stopped writing blog posts. I saw this amazing talk by Joshua Davis called Escaping Success. He is this artist who's done everything from working with Dead Mouse to having his work displayed at the Smithsonian. And Joshua says, creativity doesn't care about success, but success will fuck with your creativity. Do you guys ever feel like that? Like you get successful at something and then you just kind of stagnate? Joshua says, as soon as we get successful at something, the world starts holding us back because they only want to hire us or see us doing what they already know us for. They want us to just keep regurgitating the same old, same old, rather than innovating into new areas. And then we wind up holding ourselves back because we want to please, or because it's comfortable right here doing what we already know works. And we get bored and we stop creating. And so Joshua was trying to teach us how to escape that contentment that comes with success. And the way that he does it is with fear. He says he's constantly working to return to this place of fear because in fear, he has his greatest learning and therefore does his greatest work. I don't know if you guys know, but I used to be Microsoft's evangelist for startups, which is a pretty badass job. And when I started, Microsoft had had developer evangelists before, but I was one of the very first evangelists for startups. And what the hell does that mean? I don't know. I took the job because it sounded cool. Microsoft, I should not know. They just knew that startups did not like them. And so they put me in in the hopes that startups would like me. I had no idea what I was doing. I would go to event after event and trying to get to know the Boston startup community and hoping that something would come to me. And I go and I introduce myself to these people and they'd say, wow, evangelist for startups, that sounds amazing. What is it exactly that you do? And I was so ashamed of the fact that I had the gall to be putting myself out, myself out here in a position that I didn't even know what it was. And so I would stumble over some terribly awkward explanation of what I did. And I could just see all of the awe that they had for my cool job title draining out of their face. And apparently my awkward conversations permeated the entire room because the speaker at one of these events, this very successful entrepreneur named Bill Warner, he notices these awkward interactions. 
And now I didn't know him. He didn't know me. He just comes up to me and says, can I give you some advice? I'm like, please. He says, stop figuring out what Microsoft wants you to do. Instead, figure out what you want to do and do that. And that was the best advice that I've ever gotten. And so today, I'd like to pay that forward and give all of you permission to do what you want to do. And I know you might say, well, that's crazy, Abby. If I do that, I'll get fired. Maybe. <laughs> I was sure, like every week, that I would be fired for something that I did. But I wasn't. People loved what I was doing. And I think it's because I loved what I was doing. I think it's the same reason that I love to be around entrepreneurs, because when you're around someone who really loves what they're doing, they have so much passion and excitement and energy that it becomes almost contagious. And I believe that if you are out there doing what you love, then you're going to have that same passion and excitement and energy. And you're going to put your heart into it. You're going to put every ounce of you into it. And screw other people if they don't like it, because you only have one life. And you should be using that to make yourself happy, because nothing else matters. You should be using that to be your beautiful self and create your art and to do whatever it is you seek to push the edge on what's possible. I didn't know how to title this slide. But I hope that <laughs> I hope that all of you will leave here with a willingness to be the hackers that I know you have inside you. And I'd like to leave you with three pieces of advice. The first is always be unapologetically you. It is so important. In the very, very wise words of Dr. Seuss, be who you are and say what you feel, because those who mind don't matter. And those who matter don't mind. I love that. <laughs> Second, never accept that what appears to be the edge of possibility is really as far as you can go. All that it is is a challenge waiting to be hacked. And third, do one thing every day that scares you. Thank you.